Good morning, everyone, and greetings from my attic. It is good to be with you in all of the different ways we can be together. Just over an hour ago, my husband received word of a positive COVID-19 test. We're all fine or fine enough with just sniffles in our household, um, but it brought on some pivoting. And it feels like we have been pivoting so much that we're just spinning pirouettes at this moment. All of us, right? It is hard. So as the, the parent of, a, of my particular three and a half year old, I get to spend lots of time in the universe of Frozen, um, the animated story. And there's a song in Frozen 2 where the main lyric is do the next right thing. And I think about that a lot in these times. So given the circumstances around us, what, how do we do the next right thing? For me, that was asking our wonderful Sunday services team of tech support and music and lay leaders to carry on in the church building without me, which they're capably doing. It's going to mean getting everyone else in my family tested and figuring out what sort of protocols exist and canceling and moving remote as much as my next week as is possible. And I feel like all of us are kind of asking, are asking that question again and again as the circumstances keep changing around us. What is the next right thing? And then it shifts. And what is the next right thing? And that I offer you as a guide and just as solidarity, this is a hard time. And so many of us are doing our very best and it still doesn't always seem like enough but even our small efforts matter in ways that we can't always see. So it is good to be with you. Come, let us gather together. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, I'm Tim Bardick and I'm here in person as a member of the Sunday Services Committee. I'd like to welcome all of you to this service, both those, audit, those who are here in person and those viewing this remotely. A special welcome to anyone who is visiting this service. We hope that someday soon, we will all be able to meet in person together and get to know one another better. Of course, as Yogi Berra supposedly said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. People's Church is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association and is part of a long tradition of liberal religion. Among other things, liberal religion believes the revelation is not sealed. That is, we are nowhere close to perfect knowledge yet. And therefore, we benefit from being free to discuss and then choose any one of a variety of paths to achieving a better life, better life, better lives for all of us. Among those many possible paths are faiths such as humanism, which at its best focuses on what we can know and what we can do in this finite human world, in the here and now, to bend both our lives and the universe towards justice. I have one brief announcement to share with you all today. And that is a reminder that an open house for John Steele will be held next, next Saturday, a memorial open house um, from one to three at the Jildersma and Klein funeral home. Sandy, obviously, Sandy knows, his widow knows that this moment is not a moment that everybody is able to gather in person. And so if that, if what you can do is send her a warm thought 
on Saturday afternoon, she will gladly accept that. We're all making the choices we need to make to serve our hearts and our communities right now. Those are our announcements. <laughs> now time for our chalice lighting and i invite you if you're lighting a real or virtual chalice at your home um, you can type into the chat box a chalice is lit in your neighborhood city street or whatever place you want to identify with Our chalice lighting words are by Sean Trapp. Our chalice reminds us that the fire within ourselves is the same fire that illuminates the universe. It is a reminder that all is connected. Even though the space of the void is vast, and our experience here is but a blip in the cosmic timeline. This flame is our promise that in our smallness and our short time on this earth, that we live intently and deeply with love for one another, with honesty, and integrity to be guided by rational thought and critical thinking and with a sense of shared responsibility for as the late astronomer carl sagan reminded us this pale blue dot is the only home we've ever known Our story today is an old story from China. Once upon a time, there was an emperor. This emperor loved plants and had so many plants. This emperor also loved children and had no children. 
So as the the emperor grew older, he grew worried about who would become the emperor after he died. And so he thought of a challenge for the children. He gathered all of the children and the empire together and gave each of them a seed. And said, come back in a year and show me what you have grown from this seed and I will make the best grower the next emperor. I will make you my heir. And so one little boy took his seed and carried it home very carefully, making sure he was holding tight enough not to drop it, but not too tight so the seed would be crushed. And he went home and he found a pot made by his grandfather. And he placed the seed in the pot along with some of the best soil from his family's garden. And he started tending it gently, placing the pot in the sun, adding a little few drops of water every day, but nothing happened. He tried everything he could think of. He moved it to a different sort a more shady spot. He tried singing. He tried adding a little bit more water or a little bit less or putting in extra worms into the soil. And it did not grow. Meanwhile, all of the other children started bragging about what was coming out of their pots, how they had cultivated flowers and vegetables and all kinds of things. Before long, the year had passed and all of the children were instructed to bring their pots and their seeds and their plants back to the emperor to show them what they have grown so the emperor could decide who would be his heir. And the little boy carried an empty pot because nothing had grown. And as he got closer to the gathering place, he saw all of the other children carrying these huge plants in their pots. And he started feeling really worried and really embarrassed. How come all of these other children were able to do this big gardening project while this little boy who had put so much care and effort couldn't make anything grow? And so they all gathered in the, in the gathering place and the emperor looked around at all of these beautiful plants that the children had grown and then went up to the little boy with the empty pot and said, what happened? Why is there nothing in your pot today? And the little boy explained, I would put the seed in my special pot made my, by my grandfather. I watered it. I sang to it. I put it in the sun. I put it in the shade. I gave it extra worms and nothing helped. Nothing grew. I'm so sorry. I understand that I have no chance to be the next emperor. And the emperor said, no. You are the one who will be my heir because you are the only honest child in this whole crowd. I had boiled all of the seeds. Nothing grew from the seeds that I gave to these children. Everyone else grew from some other seed and were trying to trick me. And because you cared carefully for that seed, even though it never sprouted, You are the one who I want to care for my empire when I am no longer here. And so the little boy and his grandfather moved into the castle and learned all about plants and all about leadership to become the next emperor when that emperor, when the first emperor died. So that is a story 
about honesty and speaking the truth, even when it's hard. That is our story for today. People's people are generous people in so many ways. And today we are collecting a special offering to benefit the minister's discretionary fund of People's Church. This is a special fund within the church that we use to help people's people in times when small amounts of money could make a big difference in their lives. And this is a hard season for many, and for some that struggle is financial. If you can't pivot your job to operating out of your attic, it is harder. You might have lost income in this moment as people in your circle are sick. And as the world is just a challenging place to be. So over the last year, the Discretionary Fund has helped people with unexpected medical expenses. It has helped people avoid eviction. It has helped a family who had a medical emergency provide a Christmas to a child, a modest Christmas. So I invite you to continue to be the generous people that you are and support this good and important ministry of our church, one of the many ways we care for each other. And also know that this fund exists because there might become a season when you are the person who needs to ask for this kind of help. And I hope you are able to do that, to come talk to me and lean on the generosity of our community. Thank you for giving and receiving and supporting one another. The offering will now be received. I invite you to join me in the words for giving thanks. From the countless gifts we each have been given. Gifts of life, gifts of love, gifts of sustenance. We bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. People's people care for one another. 
in good times and hard times and all of the times. One of the ways we do that is by taking time during our gatherings to share the joys and sorrows and milestones of our lives. So if you have a joy or a sorrow you wish to share, I invite you, if you are joining us via Zoom, to type it into the chat box. If you are in person, I invite you to write it on the piece of paper near the front of the, of the gathering place. And I will pause in a moment and read aloud and place some stones into a vase of water, because that's what I had at my house. And we will hold one another in care this morning. I now invite you to join me in a moment of meditation, a moment of blessing. This is a blessing for our bodies. And I invite you, if it feels comfortable for you to begin, we're gonna place our hand on our foreheads. And if you'd rather just think about your forehead and your brain and your intellect, just do that. May you be blessed with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. May your intellect take you far on your journey. You have been blessed with reason and free will. It is your call every day to use these gifts. Now I invite you to bring your attention to your throat. May you be blessed with voice. May you learn the complex nature of truth telling, the ability to speak the truth in love requires honesty, empathy, and care. You are challenged every day to seek the joy that comes with sharing your truth compassionately, as well as listening to others. Now I invite you to bring your attention to your heart. May your heart be full and blessed with love. May you know the agony of heartbreak because it is intertwined with the elation of true love. Your heart is a strong and resilient organ, one that will be with you until the end of your time on earth. May you heed the wisdom of your heart and always trust the truth it tells. Now I invite you to bring your attention to your abdomen. You are blessed with the gift of sexuality. May you always remember that you are beloved. Your body is sacred and belongs to you alone. May you live into the full expression of your identity as a human being embracing your true sexual and gender identity. The gift of sexuality brings with it many rewards as well as great responsibility. May you always retain the power over your own being, striving toward mutually fulfilling and just relationship. I now invite you to bring your attention to your hands. When you were a baby, 
your tiny hands were your first contact with the world. Before you could see more than a few feet in front of your face, you grasped for fingers of those who cared for you. You catch yourself with your hands when you fall and you express love and comfort to others with them too. May your hands be both gentle and strong. May you use them to carry peace to the troubled and rest to the weary. May your hands always find the place of greatest need, beginning with your own. Now, bring your attention to your body as a whole. May you be blessed on your journey. May you remember that growth happens. May you always remember that you are a whole person, that all of your parts work together. May you be blessed body and mind and spirit. May you be guided by compassion, truth, justice, and love. May you find rest on the journey, always remembering where you came from, being mindful that your ancestors stand behind you, whether they are present on earth or have gone. May you be blessed in all things and carry blessings with you wherever you go. In the fall of 1995, People's Church was in a challenging moment. The minister, Davidson Moore, had just left amid intense conflict in the church. Some church members had left too, some to form the Unitarian Universalist Community Church of Southwest Michigan, our neighbor church in Portage. The Reverend Fred Campbell was hired to be the interim minister, and he offered an adult religious education class of his own design called the Four Faiths. Half of the adults in the church signed up to participate, and most of them came every week. Each week, 
the group sorted themselves into four groups, humanists, naturalists, mystics, and theists. And each week, they, in their small groups, they talked about important theological questions like, what do you believe about death? And how do you go on living? They started with a group that shared their identity and then each group shared their conversation with the whole group. I spoke with Fred this week and he reflected on how much impact that class had on the church. At that moment, the church had had strongly humanist ministers for decades. And he said a number of humanists came to that class expecting to be the largest group and that they weren't. The naturalists were. People were surprised to see which group their friends sorted themselves into. And they were surprised to hear that people from different groups came to very similar conclusions about the biggest questions. Naming those deeply held truths helped people know one another better and be in community together with more ease. Fred told me that as the class went on, the conflicts in the church seemed to calm. He, he didn't make any claims about cause, but told me about this correlation with a lot of curiosity and wondering. Can speaking our most important truths help us be better in community? and better navigate issues that have nothing really to do with our theological differences. So today, nearly 27 years later, we're returning to this idea of the four faiths in a series of sermons. So first, today we are exploring humanism and we'll hear from three church members who mostly, at least, identify as humanists. And I hope it is clarifying for you. And it can be clarifying in a few different ways. Maybe you hear someone put words to the truth that you know to be true. And you find those words, which is a liberating moment. Or perhaps the differences will be clarifying and you can react to what someone else says and says, oh, that's interesting, but it is not me. And that is rich too. And perhaps you will have the feeling that was so common in that class of realizing that someone with a different worldview comes to a very similar conclusion about how to be in the world that you have. So let us begin. Let us hear from each other. First, we will hear from Brian Lewis. Hello. I am Brian Lewis, and it is my pleasure that this is my first time to present us in a service with peoples. We have been in Kalamazoo since August of 2017, and I'm here to share where my beliefs fall in the spectrum common for you use. I will focus on our fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. This principle tends to fall under the label of humanism. I want to first mention a textbook definition of humanism. An approach to life based on reason and our common humanity, recognizing that moral values are properly founded on human nature and experience alone. I do not fit perfectly in any particular belief category. Where I fit as a humanist is I do take responsibility for how I lead my life and relish the adventure of being part of new discoveries, seeking new knowledge, and being open to new options. Classically, a humanist rejects the idea or belief in a supernatural being, such as God or a deity. Again, 
I do not fit precisely as a humanist. In my elevator speech of what do Unitarians believe, I usually take it that the person asking wants to know if I'm a believer. I am quick to point out that I don't know and further state that as I see it, I was never intended to know, which means I do not label myself as agnostic or atheist, not even theist. Instead, I simply assert, I do not know. Where my emphasis is, lays to the universal love of a loving God, if there is one. But my main moral compass is like a humanist, concerned with human welfare and happiness. And I do not know if this is the one and only life I would have, if there is a spirit either out there in myself. I have said, God is everywhere, all beings within and from out. I emphasize that human welfare and happiness is my moral compass to act and behave correctly, not because there is a possibility of going to hell, because as I already said, my beliefs is not dependent on a universal love from a universal God, if there is one, as my guide. My expression of theology, my values and beliefs are grounded in my actions, not so much in the lens of my faith, but to be just. What is morally right and fair? My goal is to be authentic, kind, and to hold grace in who I strive to be. In fact, my early upbringing, including catechism in the Catholic faith, really challenges me now. The idea of being bad or unethical all week and then going to confession on Friday and being free from my bad deeds really bothers me. There are so many religious folks for so many centuries that have used religion to justify truly evil acts. As I close, I have a clear sense of my religious identity, but I admit I am not clear on the labels of the four faiths suggested by Reverend Fred Campbell. When Reverend Rachel asked, excuse me, when Reverend Rachel announced she was seeking humanists, mystics, religious naturalists, and theists to share short reflections about what they believe during these services, I was open as I have shared my credo statement in the past. Thank you so much for this opportunity, blessings, and in gratitude. Good morning. Good morning. I'm David Isaacson, and uh, I'm happy to join this conversation. I find I have a lot in common with what Brian just said. I wish I had been here 27 years ago. I would have enjoyed those classes. But here I am in person, and it feels weird. I've been joining these services off and on remotely, and I have felt remote from myself. But now I feel in person with myself because I'm in person here. Uh, I'm a Unitarian, meaning that I blend some of the Jewish beliefs of my upbringing with my Unitarian beliefs. I bet most Unitarians came to our religion because we found something lacking in our relationship with another religious tradition. Or, in some cases, we came to Unitarianism because we found something missing in our lack of any religious faith. Uh, 
At times, I also call myself a confusionist to acknowledge that I sometimes haven't a clue what my religious beliefs are. I am truly confused. Modern day Unitarianism welcomes theists, deists, skeptics, agnostics, atheists, secular humanists, even sexual humorists, and believers in other religions as well as many spiritual traditions. People who are sure they know that God exists joke sometimes that Unitarianism, Unitarians, because of our religious restlessness, we pray not to God, but to whom it may concern. <laughs> in this church, I find content in my discontent, peace despite the constant debating society in my mind. When I was 16, I decided that I could no longer believe in the God I thought the rest of the congregation at Temple Israel in Gary, Indiana worshiped. When I confessed this, trembling to my beloved Rabbi Miller, he startled me by saying, David, this questioning of your faith is something that makes you a good Jew. I sometimes feel as you do. You are not excommunicated. Nevertheless, I drifted away from any formal connection with Judaism, but not from what Rabbi Miller informed to me. I love to read books by Jewish authors, listen to Jewish music, eat Jewish foods, share Jewish humor. Oh, by the way, you know the shortest um, Jewish joke there is. This is radio station six hundred in Tel Aviv. What for you, five ninety eight? But I I feel more kinship with my fellow Unitarians because we are so welcoming to any religious faith or set of spiritual beliefs that seeks love, justice, peace, compassion, and truth. There are times, however, when I feel so contrarian as to doubt I belong here. A part of me longs for religious certainty. I don't mean I want to rest secure in some dogmatic faith, but it would be very comforting to know that there is a possible wonderful life after death, or finally a cessation of my restless agnosticism. I also sometimes question so-called liberal political beliefs, usually associated with liberal religion, that ironically have become stultified dogmas. But usually, I embrace Unitarianism because we are so open to such a variety of religious and spiritual traditions and beliefs. I feel comfortable as a Unitarian because we are dedicated to seeking love, peace, justice, truth, and compassion right here and now. Most of us, I suspect, don't believe in an afterlife where, if we have been good on earth, we dwell with all the loved ones who died before us. I do believe, however, that good is more contagious than evil, and any good deeds I do now may constitute a legacy, may constitute a legacy after my death. The older I get, the more I'm glad I'm a Unitarian. We may be flexible in our religious beliefs, but not in our certainty that we have a moral imperative to seek justice, love, peace, truth, and compassion in a world often lacking these gifts. I'm Tim Bardick again, this time with my reflections on humanism. So about humanism, I have both good news and bad news. The good news is that humanism helps us focus 
on the really important things in this, this life, which is what we can potentially influence, and also gives us some useful methods to make such influences. The bad news is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Humanism alone is not enough. We need humanism plus some important add-ons. So my own definition of humanism, which fits in with what's previously been said, is as follows. First, a belief that through science and reason, we can make progress in understanding the universe, understanding ourselves, and understanding the society we live in. Second, I would define humanism as including the belief that what is really important is to focus on, on how to both improve our own lives and our own character, and how to improve this very finite human world. So one strength of this philosophy, in my view, is that it provides a clear target, something that's within our reach. Every moment we can choose to figure out how to become better human beings. Every moment we can think about how our actions can best make this world a better place. A second strength of a humanist philosophy is that it gives us a method, human reason, which when disciplined by both science and dialogue can help us reach our targets. We can think and learn from others about how best to improve ourselves. We can hope to learn from science about how best to improve this world. So what's the problem? The problem is that reason and science and focusing on how to improve the world does not necessarily lead to a life that truly respects all human beings. A nasty devil's advocate might argue that the famous, famous humanists of history should include leaders such as Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. They certainly believed in focusing on the human world and trying to improve it based on their own particular beliefs. In my view, a humanism that is truly humane, what could be called a liberal humanism or humanism plus, has to add in some other essential things. A belief in the equal value and dignity of all human beings without exception. A high value for human diversity. A belief in dialogue and democracy, which requires discussion with others that you fundamentally disagree with. Only when guided by these add-ons will, human, will the humanist pursuit of a better life and a better world lead to achieving our better dreams and not instead realizing our nightmares. Humanists also should acknowledge the limits of human reason. You can certainly find scientific support for uh, human equality as a proposition and for the value of diversity, dialogue, and democracy. But we ultimately cannot scientifically prove these ethical propositions. Reason at its best acknowledges the limits of reason, which requires that we listen to others' perspectives. Western philosophy begins with Socrates' argument that the wisest person is the person who realizes they are not, in fact, so very wise. When I was a seven-year-old Unitarian, I used to annoy Terry, the red-headed neighbor girl down the street, by telling her that God didn't exist. She would say that God did too exist, and I would say, prove it. Terry, as a seven-year-old, did not really have much of a response to this, and I would be inordinately pleased with myself. Now, some 60 years later, I recognize that many of the ethical proposition, propositions that make liberal humanism a desirable way of life are also not really subject to proof, or at least not definitive proof. 
the values of human equality, diversity, dialogue, and democracy must be taken on faith, at least to some extent. We have some good reason to truly believe in these values as consistent with what we know about human nature and society, but we cannot know the truth of these essential values for certain. Humanism has the right focus, that is, this human world, and it has the right methods, our ability to reason. But a truly liberal humanism ultimately needs guidance from a reasonably justified true belief in liberal values. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tim, for sharing part of your story with all of us. And I encourage those of you who see yourselves or know yourselves to be religious naturalists, mystics, or theists, to reach out to me about sharing part of your truth in an upcoming service as we continue this series. When I was a new preacher, I gave a sermon that had as a refrain the phrase, you are not alone. And as a mystic, that is a thing that I know in my bones, that we are connected to the interdependent web and to the communities that surround us. But a few days after that service, I received a phone call. It was from a person who had been there, and his call was the gracious version of a young Tim Bardic telling his neighbor to prove the existence of God. You said, I'm not alone, he said, but I am. I am old and have no family left. I have outlived most of my friends. I spend my days alone and nature and community don't make me feel less alone. I don't believe in God, I am just lonely. We talked for a while and it was a rich conversation. And that man's voice echoes in my head whenever I prepare something for others to read or hear that question of how, how do I prove it? How do I make sure the truth I'm trying to point to resonates for people with various refer references for their own belief system? Alfred North Whitehead was a mathematician and philosopher who was the central figure in developing process philosophy and then process theology. And he wrote that religion is what an individual does with his solitariness. And this idea guided Fred Campbell in his creation of the Four Faiths Framework. Religion is how we make sense of the reality that we are, in many senses, alone in the world. 
And what do we reach toward in search of connection, meaning, truth, community? For humanists, the answer is usually that they reach towards reason, science, and other humans, keeping their focus on this world. Any sort of higher power is generally not part of how humanists make sense of the world, though many humanists are agnostic, open to the possibility that there might be some sort of transcendent deity, but it is beyond human capacity to know that for sure. While there have always been people who could be described as humanists, religious humanism as an organized movement took shape in the 1920s, mostly in Unitarian churches and in liberal seminaries. In 1933, a group of prominent humanists published a humanist manifesto. And it's too long for me to read today, but it's only a few pages and it is worth your time looking at how these men, they were all men, laid out a belief system, their new belief system in that hopeful time before the Second World War. So their manifesto has 15 points, which among them are commitments to science as a source of knowledge, including evolution and the use of the scientific method in the search for truth. The points included helping each person realize their full potential they rejected any supernatural power with control over the world. They committed to working toward a more just world, including a more cooperative economy. Two other humanist manifestos have been published, one in 1973 and one in 2003, and they are worth reading. The rise, this rise of religious humanism a century ago, this dismissal of the supernatural and putting trust and science and human agency deeply changed our tradition, changed Unitarianism, and then after consolidation, Unitarian Universalism. Humanists brought questions, their trust in science, their deep skepticism of claims that cannot be proved by evidence to our tradition and much of what was previously taught and believed crumbled under that scrutiny, especially in the West and Midwest. And People's Church is part of that story. In many congregations, the humanists shook away what had been and proclaimed a new truth, sometimes just as dogmatically as the people they replaced. But at their best, Humanists leave everyone empowered to seek truth, to not take things just because someone said so, but to go out, engage in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and try to prove what is true. The bylaws of the Unitarian Universalist Association list six sources of our faith. One of them is humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. One of the great gifts of Unitarian Universalist humanists to our communities is reflected in that final phrase. Humanists, humanist teachings, and humanist approaches to faith warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. Idolatry isn't a word we use much at People's Church. And my favorite definitions of idolatry are all about mistaking some small kernel of the truth for the whole of the truth. A statue for a deity, some portion of humanity standing in place of the whole. James Luther Adams was the most important Unitarian Universalist theologian and ethicist of the 20th century. And his faith and teachings followed this rise of humanism. And 
his faith and his teaching was, was challenged by the rise of fascism. So he encountered religious humanism in its early days in the 1920s while in seminary. And he took on these new ideas as his own. They felt the most true. And then this faith was challenged when he spent time in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. He met German humanists who were supporting the Nazis. And he asked a lot of questions. And one of the most central themes of the work that emerged and carried him for decades was trying to figure out how the liberal church can resist fascism. What are our tools and our strengths and our gifts when faced with that challenge? And part of the work he explored was about this idea of idolatry. So he wrote that idolatry occurs when a social movement adopts as the center of at the center of loyalty an idol, a segment of reality torn away from the context of universality an inflated, misplaced abstraction made into an absolute. So he claims that prejudices are all idolatries and that they happen when we see only some segment, some smaller portion of humanity as worthy of love and care and respect and the resources necessary to meet its full potential. That is the idolatry of Nazism and other forms of prejudice. And that is what Adams witnessed in Nazi Germany. And humanism at its best is constantly asking us again and again to be on guard against such idolatries, to check in with ourselves and make sure that what we say is true as much as such things can be proved to make sure our efforts are aligned with our deepest values as much as it is possible to live in alignment. Of course, one doesn't need to be a humanist to do these things. I, I feel like every congregation should have its group of humanists who help us by asking us again and again to prove it, at least the things that can be proven. But this focus on the human world and on the use of reason and science as tools to use in approaching truth is particularly humanist. And having so many humanists among our church community is truly a gift to us all. So may we all heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. May we all guard against idolatries of the mind and of the spirit. May it be so. May we make it so. And amen. think there's anything better to say in conclusion than what Savannah just sang, which are some words from Theodore Parker, a 
19th century Unitarian minister and abolitionist. Be ours a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere. It's temple, all space, it's shrine, the good heart. It's creed, all truth. It's ritual, works of love. It's profession of faith, divine living. Go in peace and go in love.